All right. Now we have sound. Yeah, I, I have sound. Say All something. Right. All right. Hello. Hey. hey. Hello. Konnichiwa. <laughs> uh, Greg and Greg here with me, and we are. Uh, we're in. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're in downtown Louisville, and let's see. You see. The blue sign back there on the bigger building. Uh, that bigger building actually is the Commonwealth Convention Center, which I was the project manager when that was built for the construction company that built it. So that's kind of my building. That, that, uh, that's not the tall building, but the large building with a blue sign on it. Uh, it takes up two city blocks, and that's my, I, I built that building sort of. I, I managed it anyway. Uh, but the abortion mill is. If you see that red pickup truck, that red Dodge pickup truck on the other side of the road, it's right behind that. And there's uh, there's probably, it looks like 40 people over there right now. And uh, from what I understand, since it used to be that they rushed them all in before 8 o'clock. But from what I understand now, they because of COVID, they come in in shifts and they'll be going in there until 1030. So you may see activity. It's kind of far away. Uh, but, uh, here we are, I call this the gates of hell and, um, uh, I've been doing that for a long time and there's a reason for that. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit in today's lesson. Um, I want to get my share screen up here. Um, and go ahead and get started because I'm not sure we may not, we may get um, well, we're not going to get cut off. I think I've got my power going now, but we may get disrupted if somebody over there figures out what's going on because there are there anti-Christian people. There's three different kinds of Christian folks over there. There's a Catholic group doing Catholic prayers. There's kind of a radical, charismatic group that's that's being a little bit maybe too radical from what I understand. And then there's a more um, a more conservative Christian group that's just praying. And if you see the people in the orange vest, they're the ones that uh, escort the people that are going to get abortions in. And uh, I mentioned, I call this the gates of hell. I've called it that for a long, long time. When I think I've showed this video, this picture before when we were in Israel, uh, this is near Caesarea Philippi, and in Greek tradition, this is the gates of hell. They sacrificed, they did human sacrifice by throwing uh, throwing people off into this opening in this cave. There was a temple to Pan, which was their god of the underworld, that was at the, ga at the opening of this big cave. And there's a spring, the, the creek, and it's, it's a pretty good-sized creek for that part of the world. You can see here at the bottom kind of the walkway that's around the stream that comes out of the bottom. So their tradition was as if the, if the body came out, then the, the un, gods of the underworld rejected the sacrifice. But if the body didn't come out, then they didn't have to sacrifice anybody else for a while. So you didn't want to be in line for for that sacrifice. But this was the gates of hell in Israel. Uh, our reading for last Saturday, and we'll we'll go ahead and try to go through this. We started with, uh, last Saturday we were in 1 Chronicles 12, 1 to 15. This is where David was uh, gathering up his mighty men. And among those mighty men were uh, these guys that slung stones with, uh, they used, uh, a sling, just like David did to uh, kill Goliath, but they slung stones and shot arrows either way, and they were from Benjamin, which was, they were Saul's relatives. So, April, uh, Greg, Greg is my bodyguard here. Uh, the police just pulled in behind us. I'm not sure what they're going to do with us, but... Uh, they may come by and ask us what we're doing. I don't know. But on uh, Saturday, we're, the question we had was out, out of that passage, and why is it interesting to note that so many were from Benjamin? And my take on that is that, uh, you know, they were Paul's relatives, or excuse me, Saul's relatives, and that's 
that was his home and they were his his brethren and they still still joined joined up with with david Is there are y'all still hearing me yes okay uh, now for sunday uh we didn't have a bible discovery tv show on this uh, this is where David brought the Ark of the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, into the city of David, and he had built a tabernacle for it there. That was before the temple was built, and he, if you remember, he he sang uh, praises to the Lord, and David wrote most of the psalms. I'm not sure exactly how many; he didn't write all of them, but most of the psalms David wrote, and uh, he was giving thanks to the Lord. And if you remember. He danced, and he was just wearing his linen ephod, I guess, which is basically his underwear. And uh, he was dancing before the Lord, and Saul's daughter, Micah, or Michael, Michael, or whatever her name was, uh, talked about him being undignified. This is Kim at the city of David. We were there. This is where they were talking about. Uh, so why was, was worship so important to David, and why is it just as important for us today? Uh, David was honoring God and put himself in an undignified position with no thoughts of himself. And he was worshiping God because it was the God of Israel. This is, this is a picture of the excavation of the ruins of the city of David. Uh, that picture of Kim was up there on that balcony where that sign was. And then we, you know, we came down these steps and looked at it. Any questions about that, that section? Where is that in relation to Jerusalem? That's a good question. Uh, if you, you see right here, uh, that is part of the wall, and the wall continues around, and the wall is just behind here. Uh, the, the wall city was up on top of the mountain, and the city of David was on the south side. If you remember the map that I showed you of the, when we were talking about the two different tombs on Easter, uh, I, had a, I had this located on that map. It was on the south side of the walled city, of the, of the original walled city. Uh, it was part of the, the, the walled city. It was on the south side of what the wall is now. It's just past what they call the Southern Gate, which is Southern Gate uh, traditionally is where Pentecost occurred. Uh, they it actually occurred in the upper room, but when they went out and talked to the uh, the large crowd of people, it was at the Southern Gate, and that's real close to where the city of David is. The Southern Gate is just up beyond this this uh, edifice right here. So it's, it's right outside of the walled city that's there now. And it wasn't part of the original uh, Jebus, they called it, that was the original city before J David took over. Uh, that, that walled city was built before before David took Jebus. On Monday, um, this is talking about when David went out and went up against the Ammonites and defeated Reba of the Joab. David didn't even go with him, but uh, they defeated Reba and overthrew it. And David took the king's crown, put it on his head, and he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance and brought out the people there with it and put them to work and saw his arms picks. And David did. Uh, to the cities of people Ammon, which is kind of what Israel did to all those people. Instead of, uh, you know, God had commanded them to uh, kill every living thing, and they ended up taking them all uh, as, as slaves, and putting them before slavery. Our question on that Monday, how do we see God using David to take back authority in First Chronicles 20? And... Uh, what did he, how did he do, how did that fulfill what Saul failed to do? And I didn't really see where it did a whole lot to fulfill anything that Saul failed to do because they still took him in as slaves. But he did take the crown of the Ammonite king that worshiped Moloch. Uh, so he, I guess he took his authority away from him, but he still let those people intermingle with the people of God as forced labor. He, uh, he had, Saul had slaughtered most of the Ammonites that he could chase down. And I think the way it worded it was he didn't leave any two uh, together, that he took all the rest of them. And this is something I've talked about before when I was a new Christian, was part of the, 
the hardest thing I had to understand and accept that there, why was why were was God telling them to kill women and children? Anybody else? Anybody want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but they're the ones. That they're, it's become so it's such an ingrained part of that culture. They protect the mm -hmm. I, I couldn't hear that too well. I think you were saying that they uh, they were the ones that, that kind of brought their culture into Israel and uh, and uh, kind of infiltrated their and they put their culture into Israel's culture and Israel started uh, doing the same thing that all those other people were. But but if you, but if they did like some of the communist uh, groups uh, where they go in and they basically kill all the adults and retrain the children. Why not save the children? Well, uh, <laughs> bring, bring them up in the new ways, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's getting into some spiritual issues. Um, if you look at demonic activity uh, in, in the new Testament, Jesus, when he met this demoniac that was in, uh, that had a, a legion of demons in the tombs at Gerizim, uh, the demons told Jesus not to send them into the abyss, to send them into these pigs that were by, they're by, and then the pigs ended up running off into the, the lake and drowning. So uh, Jesus got the last laugh on that anyway. The pigs, pigs died too. Uh, but it kind of implies that the demons have to have a living body to inhabit to stay in this world and god was telling them to cleanse the land the holy land and uh that was part of the cleansing to get rid of every living thing because the demonic could inhabit all the living the living things and and the, and the people of canaan were horrible 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 evil they were they were sacrificing their children to moloch and to baal and uh, other gods that were the same gods that I think have a demonic base. And that continues to what's happening right over there. Uh, the same thing, they're sacrificing sons and daughters in the fire. Uh, and we'll, we'll get, I think our last day kind of talks about that a little bit. And, you know, to, to me, uh, hey, this is, it's a spiritual battle. It's the same spiritual battle that, that America faces and the world faces today that we're sacrificing our sons and daughters to demons. That's what's going on over there behind us. All right. On, uh, where are we? Wednesday, Tuesday? Let's see. What, what day was this? This was Tuesday. Uh, all right. David divided the, the priestly family into the divisions, the sons of Aaron, uh, divided them in, in divisions. That's Ahab, or Ne... This Nadab and Abihu had died without having children, but Eleazar and Ithamar had children, and they, they were descendants that were the priestly family at the time of David, and he divided them up according to their schedule of their service, what they were supposed to do. Uh, that was part of our reading for Tuesday. Uh, and we just talked about how he divided the priest up, and what does this show us about God's value of family? Uh, that he values family and that we have a ministry together in our family. And, and I think today that the, the family, you know, we have our, our blood family, our close family, and then we have our extended family that includes other relatives. But we also, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have that family too. And I think we're all part of that. Any discussion on any of that? I, I agree. I agree with that. All right. Uh, Wednesday, we're in First Chronicles 28. Uh, David assembled the leaders and started talking to them, telling them he's near the end of his life now. And he tells them he had it in his heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made preparations to build it. Uh, but God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. 
However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And he chose his, my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the king of the Lord over Israel. And he said that his son Solomon would be the one that built the house and his courts. And the moreover, he would establish his kingdom forever if they're steadfast to observe their commandments and judgments. And that's kind of a predecessor, you know, that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And uh, this is something I think Kim was going to, Kim would love this picture. And that's something, Kim, that's a poster you can buy for 30 bucks. Uh, it's showing kind of the face of Jesus mixed in with a lion and the lamb. Uh, so I think Kim would Kim was going to love that. And if you notice, Kim's on there watching, I think. She didn't have her picture mm -hmm. on, but she's on her phone. Uh, and uh, it says, what does David tell the people? We just went through that. What stands out most to you about this passage? Uh, I mean, I just said it for me, the eternal kingdom to the house of David. Isn't, isn't, there, your, go isn't ahead. there a trilogy? Isn't there a trilogy there? Uh, you mean you mean in the, in the picture? No, in the go back to the go back to the uh, the previous. So he says, David's been a man of war, shed blood. He's uh, to rule over he should, for the house of my father to be king over Israel. Now, Jude, when he says chosen Judah, is that the tribe? Is that is that a person? Wasn't there a son that, in Judah? That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, Judah was one of the sons of Jacob. And when the 12, they divided into the 12 tribes in Israel, so it's sort of like 12 states. And the tribe of Judah was where Jerusalem was. That's where David was part of the tribe of Judah. Uh, and that Jesus came from that same lineage. Uh, okay. So that, now, all I'm doing is kind of there's there's a there's a a three part assessment here. <laughs> okay, what I'm just comparing it to, you know, the the Trinity, you know. Yeah. You know, okay. it's kind of like the the, uh, the the divinity or you know the rule, you know, given out by God is it shared among three three people or three entities, you know. First. And I'm just I'm just making an analogy, you know, which you know I didn't think of till we just talked about it is, you know, the Father, the Son, and the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think that's probably true. There's a lot of uh, Old Testament pictures of Christ in the New Testament. I mean, basically, that's there's in a sense that's what all of the Old Testament is about is is describing Jesus and how he's going to uh, going to come and rule and uh, whether you take the Jewish viewpoint that he didn't come or the Christian viewpoint that he's coming back again uh, yeah. they, they kind of point to the same thing uh, the the Jews may have missed the first coming of the Messiah but they're looking forward to the second coming and we use a lot of the same prophecies that they do to point toward the second coming they use to point toward the coming of the Messiah and it, so there's a lot of analogies like that there. But I mean, it's a good point. Anyway, it just, you know, and, and it like David, you know, David was called to be a man of war, you know. <laughs> it yeah. Just seems like he's being slighted a little bit because just because of that, but that that's what he was called to be. <laughs> well, I, I guess that was that was certainly part of the plan. I think right. uh, he he had to lay he had to lay the groundwork to secure. You know, the kingdom. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Thursday, we talked about Solomon. Solomon was building and dedicated the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, which was the place that David had, had purchased from Ornan the Jebusite. Uh, remember, if, if you remember, Ornan was going to give it to him, and uh, David said, No, I can't. I can't take something that's going to be a holy place for free. I've got to put my sacrifice into it. So he paid him a whole lot for it. But uh, it describes in this passage the measurements of the temple from the foundation to the 
portico, the vestibule, and everything that was inside, and how it was trimmed, and uh, even even the nails, and how much the nails weighed. Uh, so there's a lot of detail on on the construction of the temple of the Lord. What what did we say a cubit was in, in our a cubit, a cubit is from your if if you can see me from the elbow to the fingertip. And and, okay. it, and it varied, you know, it's about the same, but it, the official measurement was uh, uh, according to whatever the king was at the time. So it changed with different uh, different reigns, different kings. If you had a real big king like Saul, a cubit might be bigger than it was to so a normal size king, but it, it's probably pretty close, about 18 inches generally. Okay. Um, anyway, and half. go ahead. I said a foot and a half. Yeah, close to that, approximately that. But anyway, you got the uh, description of the details of the temple. Why? Why do you think that those details were so? Uh, why, why all that's included? And I got my answer over here. You got one, Nick or Michael? I mean, the only thing I can think of is, you know, some kind of important number um but <laughs> well i it it was a the way it was laid out had some semblance to uh it's, it's particularly the way that the camp tabernacle was uh sort of foresaw the cross in the way the tabernacle was laid out and the temple not wasn't necessarily that way, but it had a lot of the uh, precursors to Christ and salvation through the line of Judah uh, that we just showed. Certainly, it was. You know, it was. I think it was divinely inspired, so that would be a reason that it would be important. I, I don't even know if this is the right word, but precision, precision. Precision is yeah. the word, yeah. yeah that's, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking, about, you're talking about the what they considered the, the resting place for God. So the details would be important considering that. Yeshua. Yeah. All right. On Friday, yesterday, we talked about Second Chronicles 8. 1 to 10, and the end is 20 years when Solomon built the house of the Lord. Uh, he went up to Amos Zoba and seized it. And uh, all that Solomon wanted to build in Jerusalem and Lebanon and all the land of his dominion, uh, he built everything he wanted to build. And the people that were left, all those mosquito bites there, um, were not of Israel, their descendants were left in the land after them when the children of Israel did not destroy. We get back to that. From these, Solomon raised as forced labor as it is to this day. This theme repeats over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Wait, wait, let me stop one sec. When they say, when they say that as it exists to this day, because because you read that throughout various passages, even in the Old Testament. Uh -huh, yeah. what, what's 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 the perspective there? Do they literally mean in our time or? No, no, no. That means at the time it was written. At the time back then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Second Chronicles was probably written. Uh, it was written after the Babylonian captivity, which was after the time of Daniel, uh, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And I forgot to put my uh, timeline in here. I could point point to where it was. But uh, there's some speculation that Ezra may have written First and Second Chronicles. There's also speculation that it was written a couple years after, a couple hundred years after the return. And we talked about that a little the other day because Nick, you asked about uh, revisionist history compared to what it is today, and and there probably was a little bit of that in there. Uh, certainly, their perspective had changed. Whoever wrote it, whether it was right after the captivity or 200 years after the captivity, they had the uh, uh, advantage of looking back and seeing how things turned out. 
Uh, but the disadvantage is some of the things they were writing about had happened 500 years before. And, you know, you just think about now, if you wrote about something that happened 500 years ago, you're going to be writing basically on what you've heard. Uh, most of us believe that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So uh, with, with that in mind, the at least the general thought should be uh, should be intact. Uh, there may be just some different ways, different different perspectives on on telling some of those things. Uh, the eventual consequence of not doing what God told them to do at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, you know, all the mosquito bites had not been destroyed as God commanded from the beginning. Second Chronicles 7, 19 to 22 came true. This is in part of the dedication of the temple that the Lord spoke through Solomon and told him if he didn't follow all of the command, if, the, if Israel didn't follow all the commandments that God would uproot Israel from his land and reject the temple that was consecrated in his name. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, Mark Twain, I, I wish I'd have pulled up some of the pictures. Mark Tra Twain wrote about this. Uh, wasn't necessarily a, a real good committed Christian, but he did go to Israel in, I think, 19, excuse me, 1869. He went to Israel and he went to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem at that time was completely... I mean, it looked like all the other unexcavated ancient places. It was unoccupied. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was just wild animals that lived there. And there were Bedouins and, and nomads that passed through every once in a while. But nobody lived in Jerusalem permanently in 1960, or excuse me, 1869. And Mark Twain wrote about this right here, that it was so desolate just exactly as as uh, Solomon had said it would be. And all of Israel was like that. Uh, and, and, and Britain, Great Britain in 1936 uh, started a program of supporting repopulating uh, part of Canaan, part of Palestine, it was being called, uh, with Jewish people. Um, and they proposed a two-state solution at that time uh, Israel was going to be a real small part, and they were going to have the Palis Palestinian state uh, would have been a much larger part of the same area. And uh, the, the Arab nations immediately rejected that and started attacking Israel. And actually, during World War II, were, uh, were allies with the Nazis. And, and, you know, you remember uh, a lot of World War II was fought in Africa, and it was because of this very thing, because the Arabs had aligned themselves with Germany, uh, because Britain was trying to send Jews back into this promised land. And, uh, you know, that's where George Patton uh, began his, he, he became famous in this area fighting against the Arabs. And eventually went into Italy after they after they beat the Arabs down here, uh, and there were other ones like Rommel on the German side was the uh, was the driving force down there in the in the Middle East before they went to Italy. So I mean, this has been a land that's been fought over for a long time, and uh, there's been five different times that Israel has. Oh, it's uh, not necessarily Israel because Israel didn't exist in 1936, but uh, starting in 48, there were four more times that Israel tried to give the Palestinians a state of their own, and it was always met with rejection and started wars, various wars, and, and the, the big wars they've had with Arabs were when they, they made offers to give a Palestinian state and give them their own, their own land, and uh, Things may be changing a little bit now because I think I've talked about that this before that in the past few years, the Sunni Muslims have aligned themselves with Israel because the uh, uh, Shiites that are being supported mostly by Iran are so hell-bent on destroying Israel and 
uh, and, and the Sunni Muslims know that after they destroy Israel, they'll come after them. So they're aligning themselves with Israel because Israel's, Israel's probably stronger than Iran is. And they don't want to be destroyed either. But anyway, Second uh, Chronicles 7, 19 to 22 came through, true. He disrupted them. And this is not in our reading, but this is, uh, this is something that I always go to. And I read this with part of the group over here earlier this morning because I think it relates to what's going on over there from Psalm 106, verses 34 to 43. And it talks about Israel and, and 1,500 years ago, or 3,500 years ago. They did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them, and they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people, so that he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times he delivered them, but they rebelled in, his, in their counsel, counsel, and they were brought low for their iniquity. And I think we see from history that that happened at least twice. Um, and I don't know that they're necessarily, that the majority of the people in Israel are, are honoring God right now either. Um, so I did pray. Greg, you pray. Come here. Come over here. Greg, pray for the beginning and the end here. Lord Jesus, we come before you knowing that your word is true and that you are faithful and that you are going to deliver your word in our brains. Amen. Because you're worthy. Do it, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, trying to turn the screen sharing off, and I can't. Oh, stop share. That does it. All right. Uh, general talk. Anybody? You might want to say anything. So I, I just want to ask you. So are you are you part of some organized uh, protest today at the site? Uh, well, not today. Uh, no. tw Twenty years ago, I was I was the ringleader. Uh, yeah, I think I think we talked about that. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> But uh, this is the first time I've been here in probably 20 years. And uh, they, they're out here every Saturday for sure. Uh, it's a mixed group, like I said. There's, they're, sometimes they're together. Sometimes they're separate. The Catholics and Protestants, different kinds of Protestants. Sometimes you've got two or three different kinds of Protestant groups, and they all pray together. Uh, what usually goes on when, when somebody pulls up, and they're going to go in and get an abortion. There's uh, the people in the orange vest or the escorts from the uh, generally supplied by the National Organization for Women or some group like that affiliated. Uh, and they'll gather around them and try to form, a, uh, I guess, a cell of people that will keep the sidewalk counselors. There are people that they call them sidewalk counselors that will actually try to talk them out as they're being marched in. Right. Uh, and... Uh, then there's the prayer groups, and uh, I don't know what their percentage is, and it was hard to cre keep track when I was out here now, but I would say probably uh, one out of 50, you would actually turn away, and uh, I don't know if they're any better or any worse than that now, uh, but I mean, it was always a joyful occasion to, to save a life. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you remember the story, you've probably heard this before, about the young man who's walking along the seashore and picking up starfish and throwing them back out in the ocean. Yeah. And somebody says, why are you doing that? You can't save them all. And he says, it makes a difference to this one. And he right. throws them back in. And uh, yeah, I believe that I'm, I'm going to see people in heaven that turned away from here and had a life because, because I was here. And I think all these other people are going to yeah. see that same thing. 
Yeah, it's something you. that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I got uh, you. And, and my reason for that, when I was three years old, uh, my mother had a miscarriage right in front of me. I, I saw a little bitty baby the size of my hand that, that came out flailing and died right in front of me. Oh, wow. And, and I saw that when I was three years old, and it burned that memory into my mind. Yeah. Uh, she was out hanging up clothes and on a clothesline and had miscarriage right there in front of me. And uh, I, I, when I was a teenager, I had a, I was the first born and I was, my mother was a little bitty woman and I was a great big baby. And I ripped her wide open coming out. And, and when I was a teenager, I had a long cry and sat down and talked with my mother about how I killed three of my brothers because she couldn't carry babies for a while after that. Eventually, after the third miscarriage, uh, the doctor made her stay in bed as soon as she got pregnant. And that's how I learned to read. By the time I was three or four years old, I had been through an entire set of child crap books uh, and, and was reading and writing letters to my cousins in Germany. And when I started school, I was so far ahead of everybody else that they had a lot of trouble with me. And I had a lot of trouble because I was bored with being taught first grade stuff when I probably was at third or fourth grade level before I started school. But it was all because of that reason. That's why I'm here now. Yeah. That's why I've well, had to come to heart. Well, I, hope, I hope you don't still carry that burden like it was your fault. So. No, 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 no. That was part of the long you know, sit down and cry uh, things with my mom. Right, right. That was when I was a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had, I had aunts that, uh, my dad had five sisters, so I should have, you know, a hundred cousins. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, but only, only two could carry to term and the rest of them had multiple miscarriages, you know, yeah. uh, could never, uh, you know, just couldn't carry to term, you know. Yeah. Three of them, you know. I have, uh, I, I say I have 92 first cousins. That's not necessarily true. My grandparents on my mom's side had 47 grandchildren, and my uh, grandparents on my dad's side had 45. But five of each one of those was my family. So I guess I really only had 82 first cousins. That's not a lot. <laughs> 82 first cousins. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I actually actually knew all my first cousins. I didn't know. I hope you didn't have to send birthday cards to all of them. <laughs> uh, well, we used to get together a lot. We used to get together at least once a year. And we continued to do that up until last year. We didn't do it last year because of the COVID thing. Uh, but yeah, I think we'll probably start doing it again after all this goes away. You know, you know, and on the readings there, because I, I, I ended up missing a week's worth of readings, you know, involved with that trial. You know, okay. Well, I think. Uh, so this is this go on every Saturday or every, on every Saturday day? And during the week too, but not as not as many people here during the week. There's usually a smaller group. Uh, so do the groups work together and act in unison? Look, they're escorting somebody right now, right? Yeah. The, the, the orange shirts. Looks like it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the guys in the. Dark blue are the sidewalk counselors, I think. So they kind of they just shadow them and, and, and try, to try to let them know there's alternatives as much as they can. Yeah, yeah, they're doing as much as they can. So let me ask, go, going back to uh, the Bible study. So uh, Solomon is uh, the wisest uh, person, king, and be told right. he would be king over over the kingdom or. Israel or something for all that time was it he was, he was the king of Israel I think for 40 years was it the next generation that fell by the wayside yes. the very next yes. generation right his, his son was Rehoboam and I think he, we talked about Rehoboam and Jeroboam were the ones yeah they were that they they didn't follow in their dad's footsteps did they no not at all yeah uh, they started sacrificing the idols that I, I guess I guess there you know here's Solomon and all his uh praise and glory and esteem and and his own boys. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he had 700 wives. <laughs> that doesn't sound wise, wise to me at all. That's about 699 too many. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, that was that seemed kind of. So crazy. we're not we're not going to judge his parenting skills, huh? No. <laughs> no, 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 we don't want to don't want to count that as part of the judgment of wisdom. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh boy. No, Michael's still there, isn't he? Yeah, Michael's still there. Yeah. He's still there. Well, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> I think I want to shut down. All right. So, uh, y'all, hey, yes. yeah, Michael's up here. Y'all keep good. Hello. Hey, stay safe. I'm going to turn it off. We're going to wrap all this stuff up. I've got laying on the back of my truck. See you, Nick. Go over there a little bit. Yeah, see y'all too. Hope it quits raining down here. <laughs> Else I'll be watching this next week with some rubber boots on. <laughs> y'all, y'all be safe. Okay, you too. All right. All right. Don't get in trouble. I don't start any fights down there. All right. All right. <laughs> Take care.